Psychology. I'm your host, Deirdre Ferreter. This is episode four, part two, with John Moriarty and David Staunton. In this episode, we continue our conversation from last week. Um, we also get to David and John's mental health toolboxes, and we discuss loads more about their experience so far and a strength-based view of dyslexia. I really, really hope you enjoy, and thanks so much for listening. You really need to be looking after yourself because you're looking after other people, you know. I mean, like, you know, in, in, in support work, as, as, as Dave would know as well, I mean, they, they would emphasize, you know, you just have to leave everything at the door. If you're, if you're not having a good day, you, 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 you can't just share that with young people, especially people who have, I mean, even if they're older, I mean, I just particularly work with young people at the moment, but I mean, it's, it's you, 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 ha- you have to be kind of professional about it. And I think, uh, you know, the more you kind of, engage and focus on why you're even doing the support work for example I mean I think the less and less that I feel that in work like I I, I love going into work now because it's just like by really kind of engaging with the relationships within work and you know reflecting on what I'm doing is helping these people you know what I mean like it, do, it does kind of lift you up and g you up and stuff like that so you can turn it into a positive experience uh, in that regard but yeah, I mean, focusing on yourself when you're when you're helping others is so important. I find now, like when I do, say, if I do two twelve-hour shifts or three in a row, that I just need a day. <laughs> Maybe I'm not as high functioning as you, <laughs> but I can't go straight into even college work. You know, I just need a day to arse around the place. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I'm more I, productive. Then, you know, I get more done then in the days that I'm work when I'm work, working the college stuff. I just, yeah. yeah. I find the same with that, which is the reason that I don't, I'm not quite as, uh, I've maintained a couple of clients that would prefer to stay in contact with me over distance therapy, but I haven't kind of taken on the number of additional responsibilities following with Jipsica and Pips as John has this year, because I'm the same as you in that, and that I really had to consider how this matched my resources, with what other expenses and what other time commitments i had going on uh whether i could do all that mm-hmm. I think i'd be more similar to you in that that sometimes you do just need time sitting down staring at the wall and take half an hour to figure out what you want to do with no prayer on you i'm just watching lord of the rings again <laughs> <laughs> um but do you have any techniques guys for like after say you finished decompressing after emotionally taxing work is there anything you do i i, I just listen to music i don't know like i mean it's not uh for me i don't know it's not super complicated like i don't know i mean um you know on my way home from work uh i just i don't know yeah i just listen to music and then maybe i'll like just watch something on netflix you know when i get home if, if i'm really kind of um if my if my head is feeling a bit mushy after you know a really emotionally taxing day like a particularly emotion tax day because you know they can't happen you know there can be days when there's a few situations in work which require a lot of um your cognitive resources so in those days i'll watch things on netflix that i've probably seen before and that i know exactly what's going to happen and people in the show will laugh for me so <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even have to do that you know so yeah I mean that would be my kind of uh, fallback and I mean when I think of it logically it seems a bit silly because it's just like you know I've seen The Office a hundred million times you know but I can still put it on and be like yeah this is nice so maybe the predictability of it um, helps me decompress or something like that but that would be in times when I'd be particularly um, drained my resources and stuff but yeah, I mean, on those days, that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit more practical focused than that. I keep a, a 
complete section. Uh, there's different work clothes uh, than different not work clothes. And when I come home, regardless of whether it's a shift from volunteering or a shift from work, uh, I have a shower. If I'm out for three hours and it's just been a tiny shift and they do nothing, or if I've been tele counseling and I was just sitting in the other room, have a shower. I have a, like it, it, there's a transitional action. It like, really helps me switch my mind set then. And I come out and the first thing I have to do has been whatever thing I thought of that tomorrow, that morning that I noted down to like, oh, I want to do this. Or, oh, that sounds good. You know, that, that thought you have of, oh, if I didn't have to go to work, I'd do X. You do a small version of whatever X is just to, to reward yourself and then get back to like whatever you need to. But I, I find having a more transitional activity is what helps me. That's good. Um, so we'll go back to Carl Jung because I know nothing about Carl Jung and I want to learn about him. Uh, so there's an air of mystery about Carl Jung when you read about his interest in alchemy, like astrology and the dreams and stuff. So what do you think are the key components of Carl Jung's work that are still applicable today? Uh, I just want to preface this with saying myself and John have done a year's internship under a psychoanalytic approach. So as we saying, we are by no means the experts in this and that kind of feeling. This podcast. <laughs> yeah. That, all is collected works and everything within a year and we understand it. <laughs> yeah it kind of something that kind of feeling was something we definitely had and we discussed a bit on our research with the fact that the odds were 99 percent of the people that read the paper would as a baseline know more far more about young than we did which made writing it with the idea of that audience in mind momentarily terrifying whenever you thought of it uh, so I just want to preface that with what we're saying has uh, I just can just give the impression of how I've considered Jung's work so far. Um, I think there's lots of aspects of his work that are still very, very relevant now. I think they're far more relevant to the kind of psychology, the side of psychology that treats psychology as an art of trying to understand humans than as a science of trying to understand behavior. Well, I think, you know, Jung in his writings discussed with great passion and in great depth the likes of the therapist's involvement in the process rather than the process being mechanical. He really discussed the importance of the therapeutic personality that we still talk about all the time as the therapeutic relationship. My One of my favorite things in reading Jung's writing that comes up for me when I'm this year, particularly when I've been doing uh, the support sessions, has been his concept of individuation, which I think kind of, it matches well to previous um, theories I've had experience with, the likes of Phenomenology and Carl Rogers, where it just looks at the sheer number of variables and the complexity of interaction with those variables in over time in integrating together into a well-functioning whole and the fact that we are all so individual and that kind of connected then to initially something about his writing that I was so skeptical about about like the idea of symbology when he was writing about things I just how we take meaning from symbols and how these kind of things are involved in underlying thought patterns and our learning of culture and so many other aspects like that uh, I was initially very skeptical thinking about how do you kind of bring that from the out from the individual to kind of get under any other understanding. But I've seen then that like, the process of individuation is heavily involved in that. And that's why the symbols have meaning. And he used that as kind of in one of his writings as kind of uh, an analogy of almost explaining culture that the shared things like that, that these shared experiences that make up subconscious thinking are kind of like what Jung described as culture, that culture is the train track the mind runs on, that it kind of gives direction. So I found that that, that was really, really very interesting and in how that kind of connected together to understanding an individual, but taking skills for of understanding and how to break down rather than trying to look at what he broke down and use that to understand a larger group, to look at the skills of how he broke it down and how I can use that with other people to understand the individuals rather than too much of a concern with groups, but at the same time looking at how common experiences, common thinking patterns and um, kind of common topics that we have in our cultures make up our lower subconscious thinking. 
uh, then that comes into kind of what John was talking about, uh, referencing with like, you know, sand tray and how we use um, this as a way to understand our formulations and transference and supervision. The looking at, you know, how the narrative occurs. It was all very interesting. And I initially for something I was very skeptical of as an approach with the fact that my undergrad was far more empiricist and cognitive based. Um, when you then try and put it into action, I found it very insightful. And it was, I kind of found well, the once I continued to try and put it into context of other authors, for example, like I thought the dissection of symbology was like trying to uh, excavate under the schemes, the Piaget schemas, and like, how do these form? How do people have common experiences that make common schemas form? Not that primarily the people common schemas, this was just intellectually how I was able to try and get my head around it and see how I could get understanding that I could equate to someone and how I could take details from someone I was uh, supporting to try and understand what's going through, going on better. So I really found that while I was skeptical of it at start, there was lots of practical sides to the approach for it and to understanding what was going on in the transference and in the session. In, in relation to components that would be still applicable today, um, there may be research out already to up, update or kind of, you know, inform of this. But I'd, be wonder, I'd, I'd, I'd wonder how applicable his ideas of, you know, in terms of the individuation and the development of the whole personality um, that the amnia and amnius has, you know, in, in relation to the masculine side of the feminine, the feminine side of the masculine, in terms of um, the strides that, you know, the LGBT community have come in, 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 uh, in redefining what, you know, gender and sex can be, or gender is, you know. Um, you know, so like, I, I would wonder how that theory translates into today's kind of um, cultural and societal norms in those, in those terms. And um, potentially there's just a, a redefining that needs to occur or something. I don't know. That's just a question that popped on top of my head when you're talking about individuation, you know. But um, something that I do understand that um, is applicable today is his work on symbols and, like, you know, interpreting the significance of the symbology. Like, I mean, you know, in 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 the santra, we'd see the children uh, represent people that they know in, in the form of toys, like a dinosaur. They could tell, say, "Oh, like this is my dad," and then. They could pick up this massive, you know, gargoyle thing and say, oh, look, here's my mom, you know, and look, they're playing and oh, my dad fell over. Uh oh, you know, and you'd, you'd be like, OK, you know, but once you consider their kind of their history, you know, and things that they've told you and uh, it, then you can kind of see the transference of those things, uh, those experiences, those thoughts around those experiences into the santra. Um, like bereavements and stuff you can see um, figures buried in the sand and you know characters fighting it out to the death and stuff like that and like death 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 I mean that that can be a really big theme you know and it, it can show itself in all these different ways but um, yeah I mean another thing that our the clinical director um, emphasized to me in, in supervisions was you know John looking he was saying like look into the dreams and ask them about their dreams and you know, the dreams are really connected with kind of things that they were conveying, you know, unconsciously in the Santre and that which connected to their backgrounds and stuff. And it was just, it was fascinating to see kind of like the development of that after having that space. Um, as Dave was saying, you know, like we're providing them a space where there's another adult who is passionately interested in what they have to say and is allowing them to express themselves however they want. You know, it's almost there's one or two where I feel like they were purposefully giddy and trying to push boundaries initially. I feel to see if I would almost give out to them or let them do it, you know, and just letting them do it. You know, I think there was like a lot of healing there because those those behaviors would kind of like subdue a bit and then they would begin to open up. So, you know, things like that have been just really nice to reflect upon and it's been really informative even personally you know when you kind of like reflect on the counter transference 
that you're experiencing from what they're you know transferring onto you so there's all these kind of things you know in which kind of Carl Jung would kind of talk about um you know in relation to the symbolism the transference between yourself and the person and yeah I mean so in, in those terms, I would say that those would still definitely be applicable today. I've just questioned some of the kind of um, things that he would have said on the kind of duality of gender, because in today's society, um, things like that, things like kind of gender and sexuality would be kind of uh, more, you know, liberal, open and uh, re redefined for sure from when he, you know, developed these terms and these theories. Mm. So on the dreams, Jan, would you discuss dreams with the with the kids? Yeah, no, I'd ask the kids. I'd be like, um, you know, so if you had any dreams, um, or like if you've been dreaming recently, or did you have, did you have like how have you been sleeping? They they might say good or bad, you know, um, or they might just ignore me and just continue playing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, sometimes they could. Uh, they, they, they could probably just tell me and they could really candidly get into some really heavy themes in their dreams. I don't like not even realizing what they're saying, but it would connect with what they've done in the, the sound tray without them knowing. And I could connect with like, you know, Jungian theory. Like there was, there was one to say like where um, someone had had the bereavement of their mother and then like, you know, they were caught in this big web and this massive spider came in and he was terrified of it. And then, you know, slowly but surely the spider got closer and closer and then they became best friends and it was all like lovely and everything. But in the context of it all, it was kind of getting closure and coming closer to the kind of acceptance of um, a certain bereavement and kind of reflecting fondly on a certain relationship as opposed to emphasizing the death, 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 you know, and, you know, and it really was it, it, like, I mean, a, a turning point you'd see in or sessions around that time, things would totally shift and granted there is um you know the natural kind of development and maturity and time to um accept the process of bereavement happening but i'm sure that um the space in which to provide the child that you know non-directive open space where they can express themselves through play drawing you know sound tray and even just communicating freely and someone is like wow yeah cool you know um mm -hmm. i think that was really helpful and, and sorry, not just asking, but on the, are dreams seen as kind of a way to process so what, what you're going through? Is that, is that the theory behind it? I think, uh, I think it's like uh, you can, you can interpret um, things that happen in your dreams. You can interpret like, you know, the symbology of something that happened within your dream. Like you don't have to take um, the dream as a literal experience, which represents something. Yeah. In the literal way, but I mean, it could represent bonds, relationships, um, affections around, you know, adversity, you know. Uh, granted, again, as Dave, as Dave said, I'm no expert, I'm still learning, but I found that um, the symbols in some of these children's dreams do connect with what they say and what they represent in drawings and play. So um, in my process of learning, I found it, you know, very helpful. In, in terms of developing that kind of formulation to incorporate the, the dreams which they share. It is really interesting. Um, so a lot of psychology graduates, guys, delay traveling and other life experiences in order to pursue this career path. So <clears> you've <throat> both studied and worked abroad. Can you share how those experiences have like shaped you? Well, you know, for myself personally, um, you know, the PLC course that I did, you know, had the affiliation with a university in Swansea and it was quite a significant you know uh, contrast from my experience before then and going into there because I came from quite a quite a strong kind of Catholic influenced background and kind of you know family network and I and I had friends who were within that network as well and everything like that you know and there's absolutely no no comment on that but I'm just talking about the kind of contrast between um moving in moving from that directly into you know living by myself in a different country in halls of residence you know in, in somewhere, somewhere like Wales you know and um people were just very openly and candidly talking about like drugs sex and sexuality and it was such a culture shock you know what I mean uh 
So I, that was um, beginning my kind of reflection on why other people didn't respond, how I responded to those sorts of conversations. And, um, you know, and it was, I think, a sort of thing where it's like, thing, conversations like that were kind of, you know, not allowed to happen or even within kind of social dynamics, there was uh, in, in social groups, things like that were almost brushed over sometimes, you know, but now it's like people are just talking about it openly quite often. So um, it was, that was kind of like start of the development of kind of my self-awareness, you know, much before the, you know, like clinical supervisions or what have you. So um, yeah, I mean, thinking about how I respond to social situations happen there, but yeah, um, like it, it wasn't, it wasn't planned the, the transition to Wales. It was just that, that link, but it's been, it's been great. You know I mean? Like the people I've met in Wales have been lovely and I worked as a bartender as I studied, you know, so that was a, an additional level of independence that I had from home. So it really was kind of the becoming of me as a more independent person, you know, than from the situation which I was before. And um, one thing I must mention, you know, just kind of like uh, a shout out to, you know, the senior lecturer in psychology at the time, um, Dr. Paul Hutchins um, at the University of Wales Trinity St. David. One day uh, when I found out, you know, when I was studying that I had dyslexia, I came to him and I was thinking like, you know, should I really be investing, you know, all my time and energy into the pursuit of something which my aptitudes aren't aligned with, you know, I felt at the time, you know, I thought like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting by, but, you know, now that I found out that I have dyslexia, why would I, you know, choose to pursue something which is so academic, which is so kind of research orientated, and then he just um, told me about uh, this, this woman he knew who was one of the top researchers in her area who dyslexia and used all of the supportive equipment who had like multiple screens and mad colors. And she spoke into this thing, which put the text in place and, you know, and yeah, it was really empowering. And he, he, he literally said to me, not to sound like a Dr. Phil or anything like that, just to, uh, echoing what he said, he just told me that, you know, now it was my turn to share the story and so that others know that they can do it as well because I was so empowered from what he said and yeah I mean from then until now you see like that was before I finished my undergrad and now you know I've got a master's and published and you know working with people like Dave and you know I, in in that sense that was kind of a, a lucky kind of you know circumstance I found myself in to meet someone like him but again it's quite quite a platform to share that so I thought you know why not you know because it really did help me but then, you know, from there anyway, you know, after, after Swansea, you know, actually, actually on that, you know, I, I was talking to, because at the time when I found out I had dyslexia, they gave me a support tutor. So I said to my support tutor, like, you know, I'm thinking of this uh, master's I found in, in Belfast, you know, psychology of childhood adversity. And um, she, she was like to me, she was like, oh, I don't know about that, it's a bit ambitious now, you know, are you sure, are you sure about that? Uh, you know, so I reflect on it sometimes and I'm just like, that's some support, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I ended up going north and yeah, just met lovely people there. And it, it, it was specific to my area of interest, you know, in psychology, childhood adversity. Um, and one thing which I would take with me now if I was doing a master's, which I didn't, didn't uh, have the understanding of at the time, was, you know, Parkinson's law, which is the adage that, you know, explains that the work expands to fill the time allotted, you know. So instead of... Um, taking more time out and, you know, casually reading on the subject areas, I would have tried to put in as more time into literally doing the assignments. So I feel like I could have gotten more out of the experience had I, you know, uh, maybe a developed self-awareness or had I had that understanding of Parkinson's law. So if someone is thinking about doing a master's, reflect on that a bit, you know what I mean? Some people can do the, you can do the same assignment in a week that you can do in a month if you really give yourself the time obviously there are extremes you can't do like a whole research paper like Dave and I did in a day you know <laughs> you know like uh, be reasonable with it but uh yeah it, it would be something good to reflect upon so I mean yeah I like what I, do you I've mean learned... by that John to follow your interests in the area rather than focus on just the academics of it or pardon what did you mean by that when you said not to just do the assignment to do some other reading 
Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I could have spent X amount of time writing up assignments and Y amount of time reading around the content of which I'm creating the assignment in. You know, I, I felt like the more time I spent writing this assignment, the better the assignment would be. Whereas the more logical and realistic sort of model would be, you know, I should read around it. You know, maybe from there I can, you know, get a kind of tangent into this other book, which may kind of give me an insight into the original kind of work that I'm doing. So, I mean, and, and I could have <laughs> realistically and personally, I could have spent more time trying to really get my head around certain concepts of statistics. So that would yeah. have been something <laughs> of computer trying to get. But I mean, these are all things, you know, kind of personal development. You know, I'm aware that um, of those dynamics when I was there. But I mean, yeah, so it's kind of like the lessons learned around the lessons. Do you know what I mean? Like the personal reflection helped me get there. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's around my experience in studying abroad. I mean, beyond that, I just, um, I, I went to London to get support work. Um, and from there, you know, I, I got, you know, the experience and I got um, research, you know, research assistant posts and, you know, the AP posts, posts as in a peer supervisor and stuff. And things started to open up there. You know, I just got my foot in the door and really developed my kind of, appreciation of why I'm doing this you know a kind of the jump between the academic world and the kind of real life um was a transition I needed to make and I felt like through support work I kind of um it really kind of synced in you know why I'm doing this you know because you know some of the things that you read like you know like the in the masters the psychology of childhood adversity like some of the things that you read like shocking but then it's just like they're working with people and you can then I started to more kind of see kind of statistics in others and stuff you know and um yeah no I mean I I, I thought it was great you know and then like that, that that support work just started me off and kind of the, the path of getting that kind of applied experience so yeah I mean it, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind hopping from A to B but you know, like I learned a lot about different cultures and kind of appreciating my own. I've become a rather patriotic since uh, leaving Ireland. That's one of the reasons I am desperate to get back. <laughs> I echo a lot of the things John has said. Um, I think working abroad is is very shaping. Um, I went abroad for my master's for two years and came back. And after I had my master's in counseling psychology, I attempted to get my accreditation in Ireland but financially and emotively that just didn't work uh, unfortunately at the time um, I had an awful lot of difficulty with people not wanting a counselling counsellor to be a young man in his early 20s um, and since then I've spent about seven years abroad I spent three and a half years working as a counsellor in the UAE uh, that was very different working with those students, a very different set of priorities in and environmental influences and in raising children there. So that really opened my eyes to kind of the biases of my Western lens and what I normalized and how I addressed that and how I also considered kind of what were my red flags for abuse? What were my, you know, what are the signs of this? How do I think of family dynamics? I, I realized how many biases I had with that kind of stuff, especially when, you know, the house next door is your brothers and sisters from a different mammy. It's it's very, very, it's very complicated. Um, but I really, really found that the three and a half years there were very shaping and very maturing for me to start understand. It was very, very useful working abroad to kind of be there with other counsellors that I, we got to have an hour of supervision every day. And there was five of us all trained in different countries, all different orientations. It was very upskilling and very supportive and really good to have that many different perspectives and culturally and, you know, academically on something. Uh, I also worked for a year in uh, Vietnam as a special needs teacher. Uh, I found that really, really rewarding. Uh, again, it, it, the cultural differences, especially when you're dealing with complex issues or with anything that is emotively important to those that you're talking, that whatever's salient, it changes so much. 
especially places when you're, you're living there day to day and you don't feel like your life is so terribly different, but then you come across issues that are just understood in a completely different way, such as, you know, uh, family conflict, uh, feelings of control and agency in people's choice, uh, expectation, what people consider as their smallest unit, you know, whether that's the family or extended family and very, very different in both those countries than in Ireland was when you look at like, for example, the readiness to change models is that I found there as opposed to Ireland, family wanting someone to change was a much higher motivation for someone to change themselves than I've experienced when I've been working in Ireland and the UK. Whereas normally family wanting someone to change then would show you on the readiness for change models that it's not intrinsic to them. Those, those motivation to change will be low and you know, you'll have difficulty getting to resolving something therapeutically then. Uh, so I found that an awful lot of these things were different and had to come out from a different lens to try and understand. So I think that really helped me with the experience of communicating and we're trying to understand the perspective that a client comes from. So I think professionally, it was an absolute great experience. I loved traveling personally. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, but I did find that to some extent, I found that experience abroad isn't really held to be of high value when you get home and that you really feel like I can see the pressure that people feel like to stay until they achieve their career goals because you feel like you're falling behind others and your experience is less competitive than theirs. So I can see how that draws people into wanting to stay, but um, I very much enjoyed my experiences abroad. I found pertinent roles that I felt were really valuable were a lot more obtainable and uh, I really enjoyed the work I got to do that I just I haven't interviewed well enough to get to do here yet sorry um I was supposed to go to Vietnam like last January but I couldn't go because of um <laughs> when you can go it's yeah, yeah. absolutely wonderful mm. um okay so we'll go back to your research guys david one of your masters one of them was on uh, dyslexia and second languages can you tell us about that uh, yes when i was working in the uae as a counselor one of my roles there was to assess whether something was a behavioral learning or some kind of social difficulty before there was to be any interventions. And what came up quite a lot that I found very interesting was the exposure difference and the fact that these students were only speaking their academic language in school and the rest of the time socially they didn't speak that language. And talking to teachers and trying to look at whether things were a social or a learning difficulty was very complicated. There really wasn't much research on that. So I decided to try and now I, I couldn't do research at the time with the students. So I tried to look at teachers' perceptions of uh, disabilities in second language areas and how people recognize that when they have the added, con added difficulty of every single time someone has a difficulty, you've got to consider how much it's an exposure issue. To exposure to the language and how much that bears. And uh, the number of students learning languages globally is growing exponentially. It's huge at the moment if you look at any of the TEFLs and any of the Southeast Asian countries that are doing that a lot as well. Uh, we, for the study, I used a series of surveys that looked at the likes of uh, recognition of accurate and inaccurate statements of dyslexia. I looked at comparing uh, teachers based upon their primary language and whether that changed communication with the students. And we looked at um, uh, vignettes as well, which were situational descriptions of students struggling that described, did but didn't indicate, indicated but didn't tell you whether uh, students had a disability. I looked at effort level, I looked at uh, and asked, what I found was that while teachers had a very poor recognition 
of of dyslexia, whether it be the accurate or inaccurate statements. For example, uh, seventy percent of the teachers I interviewed about Arabic I, that I that the complete survey, pardon me, about Arabic and English didn't recognize that dyslexia was heritable or the 80% of teachers thought that poor readers were likely to have dyslexia, that, that there wasn't the training and the knowledge there. But the big learning from research for me was us. but when we looked at the etiological responses from the vignettes is that as much as teachers weren't recognizing the symptoms, treatment and how they considered the students was differentiated based upon how the students struggled. But it just shows that there's a, a huge gap in this literature at this stage in that one, there's not enough research on how these kind of disabilities are recognized in second language. There's no research really on how it's adapted or supported and that there isn't research on the implications long term. Wow, that's really interesting. That's like fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, sorry. Right, and actually literally scratching my head, literally and misinterpreting. <laughs> um, like, so is it in the written language of English, the teachers wouldn't be able to recognize dyslexia or they could be having a struggle because they're working in their second language that might be misdiagnosed as dyslexia? Yeah, so what happened was the students perform more poorly because their second language is dyslexia. But all these assessments go against standardized norms. So one, they're more likely to meet the criteria because of poor performance. When there is poor performance, you don't know whether it could be a sign of a learning disability, a sign of a student struggling with uh, language that isn't their own, but having to do everything academic through it. Yeah. So it was just the fact that when there's already so many question marks about recognizing these things, and we know how important early intervention is, that this kind of teaching style where there's millions of students being taught this way, particularly around the Arabic Peninsula, that there just isn't the research on it. Yeah. And that it just students are going unrecognized, unsupported or students are being incorrectly labeled, which can get, have all sorts of problems for internalizing concepts of self and negative um, negative associations with disability. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I, I'd, I'd like to just first make a small adage to um, Dave's research, like without even going into um, a second language or anything like that, you know, looking back on my notebook from, uh, primary school even, you know, which I've uh, found uh, in the last year uh, back home in Dublin. Um, I think it's pretty evident that I had dyslexia, you know, now knowing, I suppose, but nobody ever suggested it to me. I found out through putting myself forth for an assessment. And um, yeah, like in terms of, like there were certain kind of um, subjects or certain kind of aptitude tests where I would score very low, but again, I brought myself forth for even a nonverbal IQ IQ test. So I did like the Ravens Standard Progressive Matrices Plus, you know, which would just be kind of pictures, you know. So I thought, okay, like let's let's give this go. Let's see what happens here, you know. And I got in the top 0.1 percent of the population. So that compared to scores that I would have gotten, which in the primary school I would have gotten in the top 10 percent, bottom 10 percent for like, you know the aptitude test for like in, even English I think but maths and stuff as well English anyway um I did very like you know I think he even did worse than that you know I, I don't I don't even want to know but just saying that um it, it is a very interesting kind of area which they did his research can I ask you guys this? I didn't give you this question beforehand but like what do you think needs to change to improve things for people with dyslexia I've heard like a lot of stories now. I have a very good friend of mine, actually, it's a positive story. And um, she's actually training to be an art therapist. She's a really good artist, Evelyn Murphy. And um, her mother always told her it was a gift. <laughs> so she never saw it as an issue, you know, and she always loved art and she just threw herself into art, she did a master's in fine art. So I thought that was really nice. But other people where it's portrayed as a negative or maybe isn't diagnosed, it's always really. I personally, I got 
I got diagnosed when I was 11 or 12 and it made a huge difference to me before then I genuinely I'd felt like school was designed to make me fail and like as if I thought I was smart but I had to do all the stuff that the other kids I thought of was the dumb kids and like being in fifth class and being taken out for special spellings where they're asking you to spell cat and dog and you're sitting there feeling like it's condescending and then you still get half of them wrong so like I really feel like during the school years it's 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 a major weight it's a major weight and a major difficulty but I think once you get past kind of like the skills the like the reading and writing skills that are difficult to pick up with you when you have dyslexia I think after that it's absolute asset I won't give it up for the world I think it helps Dynamic problem solving, I think it helps me come up with ideas. I think it helps me have a different kind of tangential line of thinking where when I've talked to people and described my kind of thinking style, it's it's associative, which is kind of something like the uh, John described earlier, where like you end up off on a mad tangent that seems absolutely relevant because like you've associated one thing to another to another. And like sometimes, for example, quite often I found that someone will ask me what I think about something. And then afterwards I'll ask them to stop and explain it back to me because that's perfect and I'll never remember it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the way my particular diagnosis Alexia works is I just have a teeny, 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 tiny, like the bottom fifth percentile size wise in my working memory. So I just, I, I can't move stuff from long-term to short-term memory. It's just not the way it works. So like it's, it's associative, it's much easier than to go because then you don't have to go through the retrieval process. So once you're not doing, once you get past kind of rote learning CAO level, I think it's an incredible benefit. I, I think it leaves me looking at things as well and having a different perspective Plus, I can also make vague, vague, vague claims of not being a neurotypical. Yeah, sorry, I'm unique, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, going off what Dave said, in terms of kind of like the the stigma associated with being dyslexic, like, I mean, uh, both, like two out of three support tutors that I've had in university have brought me down. You know, one of them told me like, essentially not to even apply to Queens because it was too ambitious. And the one I had in Queens was essentially, well, one of the two I had in Queens, I swapped because she was almost, uh, she was almost mocking, mocking me. Like, you know, like um, I was doing these exercises, which I am sure are for children in terms of, you know, phonetics, you know, and, and, and uh, phonetics uh, is where, a large part of my kind of dyslexia kind of is uh is highlighted you know in terms of my ability to kind of sound out like spell out words you know sound out words that I'm unfamiliar with I mean I can I can learn the spellings of them and then I can just smash them out and I'm done like you know once I learn I'm fine you know that's how they Uh, make you learn all spellings don't they yeah yeah what was was the one in primary school it was look say cover right check or something like that is this built into you know um, that's a bit of a throwback, isn't it? But um, yeah, so, but I mean, it was one of those things where there was times where she would talk and she'd be like, <laughs> and I'd be like, what is it? You know, and she's like, I shouldn't say that because you don't say those things to people with dyslexia. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, and, she, and she'd say something like, well, people, people with dyslexia really can't do this and do, do that. And that happened quite often, you know, and um. There was a lot of, uh, and this was uh, someone who was trained specifically in managing people with dyslexia. She had a master's in it or something. But um, she, um, she, it was clear she was bitter um, about the support that I was able to receive. You know, not that I really received much support at all generally, but the fact that people with dyslexia were able to, you know, utilize like spell checks and stuff and you type instead of write and I I joked one time because of the kind of tone of which she was speaking you know essentially trying to give her kind of a get out of you know how dark of a line of thinking that she seemed to be on saying like oh bet you're really bitter now that there's all this support in place for people with um, things like dyslexia and she was like 
do you know what? I am a bit. I do feel a bit cheated, you know? And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, <laughs> I, was, I, I couldn't believe it because she was em emphatically, you know, you know, insistent on the idea that she felt cheated because she was saying people now who can get degrees wouldn't be able to get degrees um, when she was in, in like education, alluding to the idea that, you know, she had it so much harder, you know, meaning that her accomplishments were so much more because she had that kind of, you know, she has that ability that we don't have. And you're there wondering, why would someone pursue an area like, like a job in which they have such a poor view of everyone they support and they kind of knock the people that they support to their face and they, they essentially like laugh at them. And I just, I couldn't get over it. It was a lot to kind of think about, reflect upon and process, but the idea of it, you know, like the audacity that you would knock someone for, you know, a kind of a, their unique cognitive profile, you know what I mean? Like, I would never make fun of someone for being different, you know, like, and literally talking to me like I'm a child, you know, and, uh, yeah, so, but I mean, and then I swapped to a new um, support, um, you know, dyslexic support tutor who was, uh, who was lovely. And she was just kind of going again, like literally kind of, kind of said the opposite to what the last one said. So it's really unique. But I mean, even in kind of social circles, do you know what I mean? Like uh, I, I've mentioned, if it comes up in conversation, how like I've been in this situation before where someone said that they had OCD and they felt really self-conscious about the fact that they opened up, that they said they had OCD because they really struggled with it. And I tried to kind of comfort them in saying that, you know, like, well, I also have something, you know, it's not quite OCD at all now. It's just, uh, I have dyslexia and it's affected me in this that way. And it was at least something to add. And she, she was saying that, you know, like she really appreciated like me opening up about that. But when other people you know, in that kind of environment where I was, knew that I was dyslexic, they genuinely treated me differently from that day forward. It was almost as if when I misspoke about something or they assumed I misspoke about something, they like laughed in a derisive way of which they wouldn't have before. Like, you know, um, there was one thing in which I said, for example, you know, I was talking about, uh, I'm really into, you know, UFC and MMA and all that sort of stuff. And I was talking about one fighter who had like a really long kind of arm span, you know. But at the time I just said, oh, like their their wingspan was really like, and they were like, <clears throat> you know. I love as that. If, you know, as if I was. That's the, really like poetic. The, yeah. But like as if I was like the biggest moron in the universe for saying wingspan instead of arm span. And I was just like these people would never have, you know, made any sort of, like this kind of humor was so unique to since opening up about that, mm. that, you know, God, like, you know, this guy. Um, but yeah, so just, just in relation to that, there are people who um, have stigmas against it. And I suppose you just need to rise above it because I mean, a lot of people like don't really know what they're talking about. They don't really understand what sexy is, what it is. And you know what I mean? And like, I feel like it has helped me in a lot of ways. I mean, like, I, I feel like I can think um, bigger picture about things. Like, I mean, I, I've, I've helped in a lot of ways, but like just say with that, you know, orphanage in, you know, Kabbalah in Uganda, like I've, I've helped identify a lot of things they need to address in terms of kind of how to sort out their funding. Like I set up a GoFundMe and I raised, you know, just under two thousand pounds, and um, but in that process of engaging with the director in terms of, you know, don't like giving passing the donations over, like there was no evidence of any payments really, except for pictures of, look, these are things that I purchased, and you are thinking did that cost two thousand pounds, you know, <laughs> and um, you know, so I I helped to develop kind of like. Uh, you know, policies and procedures for um, funds going into things, you know, just even for the comfort of someone who was happening to donate because that information wasn't there. And yeah, like I said, I mean, implementing things like emotion cards so that kids would be able to express themselves further. Like in research, I'm able to scan documents and like identify kind of points more easily, like I feel compared to like some people that I've been working with. So some things sure are harder, you know, like I'll never be in a spelling bee. That's kind of like a nightmare feel. But 
Um, there are certain elements to kind of like broader thinking or associative connections, like Dave mentioned, which really like it is a skill. And since I've overcome uh, some of those difficulties that dyslexia has presented me with in academia, I feel like I'm left with the kind of almost superpower of what, you know, dyslexics are, have their strength in, you know, in terms of being able to build those associations. Like, I mean, just, just connecting like ideas from other experiences and support work. Like I, I've got, I've got all these ideas. I'm, I'm going to be um, having a, I have a present, presentation set up for um, some funders in, in the orphanage for a, a non-for-profit in, in Uganda developed in mind of all these kind of different areas in which they're complaining that, you know, this is difficult, that is difficult. And working my project worker are saying this is difficult, that is difficult, you know. Um, <laughs> that may be nothing by the time this is recorded I may have just gotten a big go away with you. But I mean, like... Uh, <laughs> You know, <laughs> your arrogant past, you know, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, it's just a lot of these things I feel, you know, like there's difficulties that can be overcome. I never thought I'd be able to write the way I write now. Um, but I'm, I feel like I'm left with, you know, the problem solving abilities that, you know, have got me to the point where I am now and like people will not understand, but that's not your bag, you know, that's, that's, that's all on them. Is there a lot of research on that, guys, on the strength-based view of dyslexia? From what, I haven't checked it in a few years, but when last I, I done, I had, there was a load on the, on that, and uh, there's not as much, I've looked for it, but there's not as much similar stuff on the likes of ADHD and the OCD. Really ADHD is a complicated one because ADHD, um, there, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that ADHD is overdiagnosed, and especially in places like America, or misdiagnosed. So someone could be reacting to kind of adversity they're experiencing at home or kind of trying to distract themselves from their own thoughts and experiences of what's happening around them, you know, or just have this kind of unbridled, you know, energy which they are not able to channel you know, so it's kind of coming out and like they need to do something because they can't get it out because maybe they're not allowed to express it, you know, and people like that can be diagnosed as ADHD, where in reality, you know, maybe they just need space in order to be able to express themselves, you know, and like. That's actually what the other research that I wasn't able to continue with in uh, Jiffica, the one that had to be stopped because of COVID, that's what that research was based around, actually wow. that with ADHD. There you go. That maybe maybe that was in my unconscious and just came back up from. <laughs> Dave is channeling through me at the moment. <laughs> John's answering. Yeah, Collective John's answering for me. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Collective unconscious. <laughs> um, great. So, guys, thank you so much for your time. We've come to the last question. So, what are three things in your mental health toolbox? Um. I think mental health toolbox is very important. Uh, professionally, I think one thing that's really important in my mental health toolbox is to be assertive. Uh, I think that's to kind of clearly be clear and respectful in my communication about my needs and boundaries and what I think are the needs of others. Because if I'm quiet, it just ruminates in my head. So I, I kind of have to put myself over. Uh, I think it's really important to remind myself that I don't know what other people's lollipop moments are. That I don't know what I do that is that makes a difference or not what I do I don't know what instances make a difference for someone else so I just need for myself to do the best I can for each other one and that and personal on my personal side for mental books I kind of I have a different word for it but I run a token system where there's four things I'm allowed to kind of feel like are important that day that I can give a bleep about uh, and I don't let it be more than four because other than that, then I start feeling like there's too much stuff on my plate. So that's kind of how I manage the responsibilities I'm allowed to let myself have. When I get up, there's four big things that day. Anything else can wait till later. That's genius. <laughs> Do you have actual tokens? No, 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 no. I, I wish I did. I, oh, I'd so just give myself gold stars every day. That's the new way to do it. I'll be the adult walking up with gold stars on his face. Stick it on your forehead. I've done it. Oh. <laughs> I'm a strong. Yeah, oh, yeah. 
that's it. That's better. So that'd be the three big big things for me. That and the small one on the other side then would be when I am frustrated, it be is cursing creatively. <laughs> Obviously when I'm not in work, but as creatively as possible. Mm-hmm. Cool. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, for, for me it'd be um the first one would be something i've kind of mentioned throughout which is just refraining you know and situations are often about like perspective and narrative you choose to engage with you know it, it's so easy to be negative about certain aspects of life you know um and a lot of people compare themselves to to others you know like or the lives of others or maybe the perceived lives of others you know what i mean you know because you can really tell you know, a lot of the time people base those on you know, they're scrolling, scrolling research. Um, so, like, I mean, take, for example, the role of a support worker, um, I've had people ask me how I can cope with people shouting at me all the time and, you know, or children um, belittling, belittling me objectively, you know. Um, I've had children come up to me being like, so is this what you wanted to do with your life? Yeah? Hmm. Is it really? Wow. Okay. You're only a support worker. So, you know, I'm one place I work, they called us teachers for some reason. This was like when I was working temporarily um, in a childcare center. And the kids were like, you're not even a real teacher. Do you know that? Like, you're not even. And I'm just like, geez, man, these Burn. kids. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, um, you know, the idea about like even working <laughs> with uh, urine and feces, not to kind of, you know, turn away you know, listeners, but. Um, you know, for, for some, like, you know, it may seem demeaning or gross, as I've been told, but it's really rewarding the idea of being able to kind of give people that dignity and give people that independence and kind of help them in a situation in which they would obviously want to help themselves. Like, I've worked with someone before and um, with, you know, uh, uh, significant learning disabilities, you know, who is much older in age, and they would have, uh, they were very proud so they would have tried to clean themselves and long story short, they'd make it worse. So, I mean, the idea of helping them with situations like that, I mean, even if they don't, can't tell you they appreciate it or would refuse to tell you they appreciate it, you know, they would appreciate it. You know, you're giving them that kind of independence and dignity. So reframing the situation to focus on like what you're actually doing um, and the benefit of what you're doing, you know, as opposed to, the you know kind of like separated idea you know the split idea of like the can you know the purpose of what you're doing you know like of i'm dealing with you know poo and urine you know like i mean some people just think oh that's below me but the idea of why you're doing it um i think is really meaningful um so that's one reframing things and reflection i think is another big thing you know um people read books all the time about like how to learn life lessons, you know, life lessons taught, you know, 10, 10 rules for life or whatever they are, you know. Um, but like, what about like lessons from your own life as well? You know, like that can be so easily overlooked by a lot of people, you know, I mean, you're not your own best teacher and stuff, you know, like through reflection, we can better identify our own patterns and, you know, whether it's thoughts or behaviors and, you know, which may provide us with the right questions we need to ask ourselves in order to address these kind of, you know, patterns and make ourselves more, self-actualized as Dave was saying you know more a whole kind of individual person you know and more in control of our unconscious not let our unconscious just drive where we're going but being aware of why we're acting the way we're acting and you know just having more of kind of like uh you know enmeshment as opposed to like separation of when like the unconscious just takes the wheel you know so I think practicing you know reflection is essential for kind of you know meaningful growth uh, not only in deep end interviews and stuff like that, but just generally, you know, and I found that to be true anyway, you know, I mean, like sometimes in a situation I could be unapologetic and I could not, I, I, I might think, oh, I did nothing wrong there, everything's fine. But then I could reflect on it later and be like, probably could have behaved better there. Why did I behave that way? But then I can understand it, not from a kind of self-deprecative way, but kind of like a understanding the context and understanding my personal motivations better. So yeah, there are situations like that in which I feel like the reflections help me. And the last one would just be gratitude. You know, I'm, I'm healthy and independent. I've supported people that are not independent, supported people who have nothing. You know, I've got, I've got a lot going for me, even though, like, you know, to someone else, you know, who is um, 
like our friends who like first job out of uni like they're earning like 60k working for Goldman Sachs or they're working you know in business and they're earning like 40 50k and they're all like yeah man it's cool got me mortgage you know but it's just kind of like um I'm happy healthy I'm doing work that I, I think is meaningful and I enjoy and I can see my own personal progress from where I was it's it they're all personal you know kind of experiences and like it's, it's your personal journey it's not kind of like a you know, you know, rub it in your face competition. <laughs> Not to say none of them did that. I, I'm more kind of just emphasizing like everything is unique. I mean, when I was working with, you know, the other week, you know, when I was having my, one of my weekly meetings with a project worker, she casually mentioned that one of the children had malaria. <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, and she's like, yeah, but, but she's improving. And I, <laughs> I just... It took me a minute to process that because it was so casual, you know, but it's one of the one of, one of the luxuries of even being in the area which we are, you know, that's not even a, something that we have to concern ourselves with. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, being, a, being in a position to be able to help people in a meaningful way and have the opportunity to develop, you know, personally, professionally, you know, and get this, you know, develop self-awareness and just understand different cultures and understand people in a more meaningful and deep way um through understanding myself better as well you know there, there's a lot to be grateful for you know life could have gone in a hundred different directions you know and uh i'm happy with the one we're at at the moment considering all these things so yeah yeah they're my three tools <laughs> <laughs> so much guys that's a lovely place to leave it and thanks so much for your time i really appreciate it uh, uh, don't forget me when you're clinical psychologist <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. get on that doctorate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Absolutely. Yeah. laughs>